But if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles, I hope you have those. To 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. If you need help, it's in the New Testament and it's right before second. Uh, second John. It's right before the end of the book. Right before second. First John chapter two was right after First John chapter one. <coughs> and if you need to look in the table of contents, there is no shame in that either. I know there's some people who maybe, for one reason or another, maybe they don't read their Bible a lot, or maybe they just read their Bible plenty, but they have a problem, you know, with the order of the books. You know what I mean? Sometimes or oh, I don't want to look in front of the table of contents in front of everybody. It's like, just look at the table of contents. No one cares. And if they do, then, well, their mind is focused on the wrong things, seriously. Okay, so, and you, you'll notice that we didn't really finish up chapter one last week. And part of the reason being is because, again, we're not going to spend several years in this because, frankly, I want to get through it just as quickly as you probably want to get through it, right? And so we're kind of doing, you know, it might be one week or maybe even two weeks in a chapter, but then we're going to move on. We're not going to spend a month, a month and a half in every chapter and just kind of drag it out. Um, not that... Uh, not that I want to speed it along because it's not important, uh, but partially because sometimes it can, you can drag out a study so long that by the time you get to the end, you forgot what you studied in the beginning and you kind of lose the scope of things. Um, also, uh, there have been some recommendations on classes that people would like to hear and like to get to, like final things, kind of, you know, what happens, uh, you know, what happens when we die. Um, that was one, and then there's there's a couple of others. So First John, again, the purpose of this is to cover the Johann the Johannine epistles in their entirety, just using these broad strokes. And and the purpose of this particular part, I guess we call it part three after the introduction, uh, is to develop the understanding of our advocacy in Christ. Uh, to develop how we are to walk in love or fellowship uh, one with another and to develop the understanding that we're not to love the world as the world loves itself. Right? And I say as the world loves itself because it's not that we are to love the world or that we're not to love the world because we do need to express love toward people and what have you and those people are in the world, but it's that we don't love the world as the world loves itself, if that makes sense, right? Uh, it's basically that we love the world as Christ loved the world in the sense that he served people and gave himself for people and, and whatnot. And if you recall in the, the introductory class, um, we see 1 John, the entire letter, divided uh, really into three sections. Uh, there is in chapters 1, verse 1, through chapter 2 and verse 2, God is light. And then in chapter 2, verse 3, up through chapter 4, and verse 21, is God is love. And then chapter 5, God is life. So God is light, God is love, God is life. Okay? <laughs> and I can put these on the, on the Facebook group as well. So the last piece uh, of God is light, it continues from chapter 1, uh, through the beginning of chapter 2, wherein we have an advocacy in Christ. Okay. Uh, remember that sometimes uh, it can look uh, slightly skewed to us to see perhaps a context carrying from, you know, maybe the end of one chapter to the beginning or middle of another chapter and what have you. We have to remember, though, that in the original Greek language, there were... It, you know, in, in these letters, there were no chapter divisions. There were no verse divisions. They, uh, New Testament Greek doesn't even have punctuation. You know, so just think of typing out or writing out just long sentences and no punctuation at all. 
And so it, it's not unusual for you know a context to overlap because really it's not overlapping. It's over only overlapping because we inserted uh, chapter and, and uh, verse verse divisions. So we we enter into this phase of God is love and commence with how we as Christians are to walk in love, uh, thus facilitating our fellowship. And, and that's followed by the Apostle's words of caution against loving the world. So John begins in verses 1 and 2 with a twofold uh, purpose. Uh, there is the intention of his letter, and then there is the source of our comfort when falling short. Uh, if, you, if you look, for example, there at the beginning of verse 1 of 1 John chapter 2, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So the am writing, there it's, it's point, it points to both what has already been written and what is currently being written and what will further be written uh, later on in his letter. And what he's going to continue to remind the readers of. And what has John told them so far? So since we since he's talking about I'm writing these things, and it also points back to what has already been written there in chapter one, we have to ask, okay, well, what has he told them so far? Well, first, does anybody know? I don't know if anybody took notes last week. Oh, if you you want. Oh yeah. Oh me. If you did. <laughs> You got your notes out here, look. <laughs> well, um, he tells them they are the church. They're, um, let me see, and we'll get my notes. They have to not sacrifice to idols, to be good Christian children, John 2 12. Um, I'm not sure exactly if that's what, 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 what I'm talking about. Yeah. I always hated that in school, too, because the professor would say, hey, what about this? And you're like, I honestly have no idea what answer you're looking for. So it's okay, really. Um, you might remember that um, he, he said that he's a witness to God, a God who has both been seen, a God who has been heard, a God who has been touched. <laughs> because remember, he's writing to these kind of Gentile Christians and much of the world at that time is still under the belief, whether Greek or Roman, uh, both uh, people believe that their gods uh, resided on Mount Olympus and didn't really have a lot to do with people unless they were torturing or making fun of or ruining people's lives. And it's very much like Paul when he was in Athens and going through and saying, you know, you've got all of, you're very religious people. And you have all of these different statues, and you've got one that says to the unknown God. Well, that's the God that I want to talk about. And so John, he's really saying the same thing. This God that you don't know is a God that I have personally witnessed. We've seen him. We have heard him. We've touched him. He's not off on some far mountain somewhere. But he is here. And he came in the flesh. And he wants to be a part of that. Um... Uh, so not only that, but he also wrote that God desires for his people to fellowship with him, uh, to fellowship with Christ, to fellowship with each other, fellow Christians. So he's talked to them about that. And that the same God wants them to walk in the light where he's in the light. So he's already given them several things. You know, so I'm writing these things. I'm writing to you about a God that is seen, heard, and touched. I'm writing about a God that loves you. I'm writing about a God that wants to fellowship with you and wants you to fellowship with others. I'm writing about this God um, that wants you to walk in the light where he is so that you may not sin. But also so that their joy may be complete. Right? Now... John is not saying that if you do these things, you'll not sin, but that you may not. And, and it's a subtle difference, but there is a difference. Um, one, you know, the will not sin is the absence uh, of sin uh, altogether, uh, which we know that we can't do, right? Uh, I mean, people sin every day uh, because God's standards are so high. We're not able to meet his standards. But 
that's that should uh, you know kind of build within us an even greater appreciation for God's mercy and grace. There's a standard that we can't possibly meet on our own, which should cause us to appreciate the sacrifice of Christ on the cross even more. Right? So one is that there is a complete absence of sin altogether. We know we can't do that. The other presents itself as having less of an opportunity to sin if you're focused on these things. Right? If you are focused on trying to walk in the light where God is, if you are focused on trying to fellowship with God, uh, th fellowship with God through, uh, through not only worship on Sundays or classes or what have you, but uh, fellowship with God through prayer, fellowship with singing in your praise hymns in your car, uh, fellowship with God, uh, you know, in studying your word, meditating on, on it, or studying his word, meditating on his word. So if we're focused on trying to walk in the light, fellowship with God, fellowship with Christ, fellowship with the Spirit, and fellowship with other Christians, this is one of the reasons that the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 9.25, not forsaking the assembly as is the habit of some, and knowing the importance of Christian fellowship. Trying to do these things, there is a less of an opportunity to sin. Because you're busy doing other things, you know? Uh, I mean, uh, who's ever heard the phrase, you know, idle hands or what? The devil's, the devil's workshop or the devil's playground. Yeah, because you don't have anything else to do, so what are you doing? You're getting in trouble, you know? And so if we focus on these things, he's not saying that we won't sin. It's that there is less of an opportunity to sin because we're busy focusing on Him. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Well, you also told us the, that fellowship in, their, in the, the true definition is a partnership mm -hmm. with God. It's Absolutely. Not, it's not just a flip I'm going to talk to you or I'm going to talk with you. Right. Just like when we were talking about confession. Um, and that confession of sins, it's not just, ooh, I'm sorry, you know, my hand got caught in the cookie jar. It's a matter of seeing sin the way that God sees sin and taking on that mindset and that, that understanding, you know. Um, because if we, because that helps facilitate true repentance, right? Because there is a repentance that leads to death and there's a godly repentance that leads to sorrow that leads to life. And so, just in, in touching on what we talked about, the idea of confessing one's sin, some people it's just a matter of, you know, I sinned, I did this wrong, okay, I'm forgiven, we're good to go, right? And then they go back to it. Now that's not to mean that, you know, there are sins that, you know, once confessed, people will never go back to, that's, right? But uh, is that if we, if in our confession we are truly confessing and seeing the sin as God sees it, and that's in the truest sense of the word, in seeing how much He abhors sin, and we have to take that into our mind and our heart, then it's not that it's not going to be impossible, but it's going to be more difficult because there's going to be an internal struggle. I would never say that just because someone confesses a sin, that doesn't mean they're never going to even commit that same sin. And that would be stupid. You know, if, I, if there was someone who were, let's say, a, a, you know, let's say even a six-month heroin addict, and they were to get up there and they were to confess, you know, I've been doing drugs and everything, and, and you know, I, just, I confess that it was wrong. Do I honestly expect them to, to not struggle with that or to not even maybe have a lapse? And go back to to that, you know. Um, thoughts, comments. I, I think we need a twelve step repentance class, or <laughs> no, we just or a program. Like, you know, where you get a, 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 a oh, like a coin. A coin. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I'm not going to lie. Uh, if you don't know what he's talking about, like Alcoholics Anonymous, for example, they have a 12-step program, and when you reach certain points, you have a coin that you get. Uh, I think NA, which is a Narcotics Anonymous, has the same thing. 
You know, um, I'm not going to lie. Some of those, you know, the church could learn a lot from those programs. I mean, it really. I mean, if we're being honest, but because, and you know, in um, one of the things that uh, we were encouraged to do, I don't even know if Rachel knows this, uh, in preaching school was to visit um, AA meetings, NA meetings, and things like that. Now, talking to the facilitator and letting them know, you know, hey, look, this, this is kind of what I'm doing. I'm not here to report on anybody. Uh, I'm not participating. I'm not struggling with this, but, you know, really trying to understand what's going on. And if you've never been to one of those meetings, I can tell you, that for the most part, they are completely open. People, you know, say how they feel, what they're struggling through, and because the other people are struggling with it as well, maybe some people are farther away from the initial start of the struggle, right? Maybe someone's been sober for 12 years versus 12 weeks. Um, is that the people are honest. No one's there to judge anybody. Uh, when someone starts up with the program, there are steps that they need to go through, like making amends with people that they've wronged and things like that. They have uh, a sponsor, someone who, if they are struggling, they can call up, and that person, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll talk to them over the phone if they need to. They'll go to their house. They'll go to wherever they are to pick them up and get them out of the situation. And there is, I don't want to call it a reward. Uh, but more of an achievement, you know, that, that token to remind how far they've come. You know, whether it's a month, six months, I can't remember the exact timeline of when they, they're given out. But, you know, something tangible that they can actually look at and see what they've been able to accomplish. I'm just going to tell you right now, the church, we could use that, a lot of that. Maybe not a token, but we could use people being able to be completely open and honest, which the Bible tells us to do, and without judgment, the fact that we should ha be able to call, you know, anybody in the church, but even if it's not just anybody, just one person to say, look, I'm struggling with, uh, let's say it is a sin, I'm struggling with such and such a sin, and being able to confide in that person, and not you confide on them on Saturday night, and by Sunday morning, you feel ostracized because everybody knows because people can't keep their mouth shut. You know? There, there's a lot. Yeah, I agree with you. The church needs a 12-step program. Oh, yeah, we got the Bible. Well, you know what I mean. We don't, no, what we need is to apply the Bible righteously. Maybe we should apply it in 12 steps. No, it, 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 12 <laughs> steps do it. I went to uh, what was called a family mm -hmm. And it was a few of my deceased husband. We went when we had issues or problems. And the family synonymous was more for people who had problems with their children. Yep. You know, whatever that problem was. It helped me to work through these 12 steps and to work with the people that helped me. But my husband, at the time, Chuck, he, want, he quit going because he said, when he listened to other people and how bad they were, he thought, oh no, you know, this is what we Like maybe that's what's going. coming down the road. Yeah, but they did, but anyway, yeah. anyway, the 12 steps are biblical, I believe. <coughs> I, I agree with you. It, in the sense that, yeah, we have the Bible and we just need to apply it to everything. I think one of the, and I think this is one of the key differences as to why people in those anonymous programs, there is someone who facilitates, but ultimately the people rely on each other, right? When it comes to the church, most of the time people rely on the preacher and they rely on the elders and not necessarily each other. For, for support, counseling, what have you. you know? That's just kind of, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that's the way it is. Whether you agree or disagree or, or whatever, I'll tell you this from a preacher's perspective, that's how it is. I can guarantee you in every congregation. Maybe you're not one that's relying on the preacher or the elders that much, but I can guarantee you nine times out of ten, that's where it is. You were going to say something to what she said? Um, I could... <laughs> Rachel's like, I got nothing to say. No, 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 no. 
Okay, look, we barely got into class and it's 7.30. 7.27, you got three minutes. <laughs> I don't care, you wrote no, me. Rachel, you're cute. Um, no, Pam is absolutely right. The thing is, is if people who want to do better, they'll go to AA, they'll go to Family Anonymous. They make that their mission. When we choose to fail to make the, the church and the Bible and God our mission, we do fail. Mm -hmm. It is up to us to put God and his will above our, our will, our mission, our personal mission, our private mission, our family. We put God first and everything else second. And that is how we succeed. We, depend, we, we choose to say, I'm going to tell you my problem and I'm going to hopefully pray for you. And you know what? If she tells the world what's going on, you know what? You pray for her. But you still keep going. You don't let what someone else tells you do fail you to come here. Because at the yeah. end of the day... You just might not trust her again. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, what you do and how you act tells tells is how you're getting to heaven or hell. Yeah. So you can take the uh, the application of outcomes from you know those who want to succeed, put it in the church. You don't have successful people, but the yeah, mindset is not doing the, what they they're doing what they want to do. So yeah, no, and that and that was what we were saying. It, it's just kind of taking maybe not that specific model of using you know twelve actual steps. But you know the principle and the idea behind it are on how it how it operates and what have you. Uh, any other thoughts and comments, and then we'll actually get into, into the class. No, it's your call. Not my circus, Rachel. Okay, so he said that he's writing these things, and, and now. <coughs> So we look at the difference. Now, here's the thing. Look at the rest of the verse. So the end of verse 1 and verse 2. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and He Himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins only, but also for those of the whole world. So He says, I'm writing these things so that you might not sin, but if anyone sins, or if anyone sins... And so that right there tells us that he's not talking about perfectionism here. It's like if you are walking a Christian walk and you stumble, or you don't just stumble but you completely fall, then you don't need to lose hope because there is an advocate with God who is Jesus Christ, uh, who is righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins. See, an advocate, uh, an intercessor, or a comfort, right? When Jesus was talking to the disciples before the cross and he said, look, I have to go. And when I leave, a comforter is going to come. Uh, you can replace that word, even though we know he's talking about the Holy Spirit, you can replace that word comforter with intercessor or with advocate. That there, there, there was someone there. Um, in writing to those in Rome, Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 34, Romans 8.34, Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. And the author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 7 and verse 25, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So he lives to make inter intercession for them, for us. And, and in that Hebrews 7.25, it's, you know, we notice uh, those who draw near to God through him. Because what did Jesus say? You can't get to the Father without going through me. I'm the door. Right? So he lives to make intercession for them. Too many people, they allow sin to control them. You know? Some sins... I mean, we're all, you know, we're adults. We know that there are some sins that are definitely harder to manage than others, right? Uh, for some people, it might be drugs. For other people, it might be pornography. Whatever the case may be, you know, is that there are too many people who allow sin to control them, and too many Christians allow sin to prevent them from moving forward in, in their path to heaven. Sin gets in the way, whether it's their own sin or someone sinned against them or someone did something against them. And next thing you know, everybody's acting like a four-year-old, stomping their feet, saying, I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. 
you well, know. There's some of your steps right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you go the steps taken a while ago. Oh. <laughs> you go through Christ, you come back to him and ask for his help. You go to your brothers and sisters because they're there to be your support system and your encourager. So there's, I mean, if you're looking for steps, they're... Yeah. They're very black and white. <laughs> and here's the kind of thing, like Rachel said, if you share, first, we should be able to share issues with each other in confidence. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, right? We're all trying to get to the same place, right? And if you share something with someone in confidence, and they go spilling the beans to everybody, okay, first of all, that's not on you, Right? Uh, that unless you do it a second time after they you know kind of spill the beans, then that well that's that's just playing your own dumb fault. You know you knew that they had loose lips, and so but that's on them. It's like Rachel said, pray for them, because the Bible speaks against gossip. It speaks against backbiting. It speaks against talking about people and what have you. So it's kind of like yeah, pray pray for them too. But ultimately, don't let what that person did prevent you from coming to worship and fellowshipping with the saints and fellowshipping with God and, and, and what have you, right? And no one should get so desperate that they do not realize that Christ is there living to make an intercession for them, to comfort them, to be an advocate for them, right? A propitiation uh, used there, it means an offering to appease or an atoning sacrifice. An offering to appease an, or a, an atoning sacrifice. It, you can look at it this way. Because Jesus died on the cross, because Jesus appeased the wrath of God, because Jesus was an atoning sacrifice, he is able to intercede for us. He wouldn't be able to do that had he not died on the cross. Right? Because had he not died on the cross, we'd still be under the, the sacrificial system dealing with bulls and goats, and we already know that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins, right? So in, in the grand design, atonement, it's not a way of gaining favor with God. It's more of God's gift to man. Just Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11. So... Levit in Leviticus chapter 16, you have the Day of Atonement. Leviticus chapter 17 deals with the blood of the atonement. And when you look at Leviticus 17 and verse 11, it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your soul. So this is God speaking, right? He says, So the life of the flesh is in the blood. I, that is God, have given it to you, to, to make on the altar an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Now, the word atonement there in Leviticus 17 and verse 11, it comes from the Hebrew uh, kafar. Uh, and that means um, to cover uh, or to cleanse or to cancel. So it's going all the way back. And at the Last Supper, before the cross, Jesus said in Matthew 26 and verse 28, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And tied to that, Hebrews 9.26, that says Jesus put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So we have, the, we have God talking about life is in the blood. I have given it to you for the altar to make an atonement, to, to make a cover, to cleanse your souls. Now in the Old Testament, that was the blood of bulls and goats and pigeons, you know, for the poor people. But in the, we get technically still in the Old Testament, but we get to Jesus and the cross, and that is the same thing, is that he, God gave himself to us in the form of man, Jesus, went to the altar of Calvary, his blood was shed for what? Not for his sins, because he was sinless, but 
for ours, Hebrews 9, 26, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And so because Jesus was that spotless lamb, he was that perfect sacrifice, his blood covers us, cleanses us, at the same time appeasing the wrath of God, it is because of that that he is able to intercede for us. So John writes and says, look, I'm writing these things so that you might not sin, but if you do, I don't want you to forget that we have the perfect, we have a God who we, we can see, we can, we, or I, he, you know, the witnesses, have seen, have heard, have touched, not a God far off, but a God who came, he died, and the whole reason that he died was so that he could stand between us and God to say, this one is mine. This one is mine. John's letter here is, it, it's, it, it, it's no wonder that he's known as the apostle of love, or the love apostle, right? Um, could have been better unless he was born maybe in 1969 or Woodstock, New York or something. I don't know. But, you know, because he's all about trying to get people to love God, to love each other. Right? Any thoughts or, or comments? I have a question. Sure. Or questions. That's all right. We've got 20 minutes. What is what was the point of when Jesus took his last breath? Uh -huh. Is that when we were the new covenant started? Um, there's some debate on that because some people believe it's when he died. Um, some people believe it was when he was resurrected um, because you know we have Paul uh, writing that you know without him being raised from the dead we have no faith. And so that's one of the reasons uh, that goes for that. Um, so it really depends on what side of the theological dividing line you want to fall on. Because at least we know before his death, right. it was the law. Yeah, uh, and that's the thing. You know, we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we've got all of this. And, and you know, it starts right after that little page in your Bible that says New Testament. But technically... Everything up to the point of Jesus dying on the cross is in the Old Testament. It's under Old Testament law. But yeah, then he gets on the cross and he sits there and he says to Telestai, it is finished, gives up the ghost. I wore this shirt because I knew that he would ask that question. I don't know why. It is finished. But yeah, so we, we do know that at least up until that point it's old law and everything's old. Yeah. Any other thoughts, comments, questions, complaints? He also begins saying children, emphasizing the fellowship of one with another. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Little children. My my little children. And a lot of people think that he starts off with the my, my little children um, uh, because he is writing specifically to a congregation that he established. Like there's the possessive my, you know, uh, because, you know, all Christians being God's children, right? Uh, and then, uh, and so a lot of people think that him saying my, using that possessive pronoun, he is talking specifically about a congregation that he had in his travels walked around and established. But, but there's, no way, there's no way to tell, you know. But no, I, I do certainly agree with your point in children and that, that familiar relationship uh, there. Absolutely. <clears throat> Any other thoughts? I got a question for you. Sure. So... Were the apostles before Christ came, were they doing the Jewish thing like sacrificing animals? Yep, absolutely. But Jesus was never sacrificing animals. Well, yeah, he, he would have. Um, when, and it wasn't, and 
You know, Jesus said that he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Him being a Jew, he would have participated in everything that the Jewish people would have done. Um, you know, so you think Mosaic law, he would have been cir circumcised. His parents, uh, they have that we have that they were going to the temple and that they were dedicating him. Uh, they were having a baby dedication uh, that he was there. So yeah, he would have done everything that the Jewish people would have done. But during his three years of like leading his apostles and teaching people, he never said, "Go get me." A lamb, and we're going to sacrifice him here. Yeah, um, and, and that's the thing is, yeah, we do. You're absolutely right. We don't have him saying, you know, go get me a lamb to slaughter or anything. the The difficulty that we have is, for example, from Christ's birth up until the beginning of his ministry with the baptism of, of John and everything. We only have one account of this childhood, which was when he's about twelve. And his parents, you know, they're going to the temple and they lose him for like three days at Walmart. And then they finally find him back and, and what have you. But no, he would have been, do, he would have been doing everything um, as far as specifics of him telling them, them that. We don't know if he did or not. Um, there are some thoughts on it. One is that, yes, he did do that because he was a Jew. It was still the Jewish law. And that he would not be able to convert any Jew if he were blatantly disregarding the Jewish law, right? Um, how can you say that you're a Jew or you're coming to save the Jewish people and yet you're not even following the Jewish law? Um, some people say that, um, so that he did do that, but it wasn't recorded for us because it's not important um, or because it's uh, not that it's not important, but that people would choose to focus on the, on the wrong things. Um, was he going against Jewish law when he was healing on the Sabbath? On the Sabbath? Like that? Uh, yeah, but that was really, it was, but that wasn't against the law that God had instituted. It was the law that the Pharisees had done. So we have the Mosaic law, right? And then it comes along with the Pharisees and Sadducees and the Sanhedrin Council and, and all of this and the scribes. They start adding to it. It's basically commentary, right? And people, and they start enforcing the commentary as law. You, you can look at it this way. Like, let's say you've got a study Bible, right? So you've got the Word of God there, and then you've got all the commentator notes at the bottom. Imagine someone trying to tell you that those notes that are at the bottom, that those are also the Word of God and they need to be followed as well. So you kind of look at it that way. So you got the Bible, you got God's law, and then you've got the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes making comments down here, and they're enforcing that. Because there were two types of laws. There was the written law, which obviously was written, and then they had the oral law. And the oral law, let's face it, that could be easily corrupted. I mean, just think of an Old Testament game of telephone. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I, technically he was going against the law in the sense that it was the Sabbath and they were saying not to do these things. Uh, but it's like Jesus would say that um, uh, the, the Sabbath wasn't made for man, man was made for the Sabbath. And that him, being the author of the Sabbath, can do whatever he wants on the Sabbath. <laughs> So yeah. So God was like telling Moses, like stone these people to death, and he was telling Jews at times to draw your swords and kill them. Yes. But Jesus never did anything like that at all. Well, it wasn't necessarily law that when he was telling them, for example, go up and smite these people, it wasn't a law that he was telling them to do. That was just him, well, telling them to do. Rather, yeah. Uh, so that, yeah. So. And, and that's, a, that's a great point and a, a distinction to make is that just because God's, and this is going to sound weird when I say it, but hear me out. Just because God said something, that doesn't make it law. Right? Okay. He told them things to do that were very specific laws. We look at the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. We look at the, how they were to build the tabernacle later in Exodus. 
We look at the sacrificial system in the first five chapters of uh, Leviticus. We look at all of these things that God told them to do, and it was laws to do, right? Mm -hmm. But then, like to Mark's point, God telling them, you know, okay, you need to go and smite the Amalekites. That wasn't a law that God said, thou must always smite the Amalekites, or, you know, whatever. <laughs> that was good, God just telling them what to do. And so that's what I'm saying, is that just because God said something, that doesn't mean it was a law. Somebody didn't engrave it in a rock. <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense, though? Because I really want to be clear when that you, it makes sense. When you talk about Jesus observing Jewish customs, mm -hmm. we know he went to Passover. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jesus drank up all at once. I wasn't getting to Oh, there you go. <laughs> but when they didn't have any water for seven days, and yeah. even, everybody got one. They had a life straw, you know, just go to the go to the Nile and it filters out all the impurities and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> to the and by the way, on the alcoholic comment, just to be clear. Most commentators do believe that at least up until the point when he was an adult, that he would have drank alcoholic wine because he was a Jew participating in Passover. And I just read one of the back to the passage and go back to the... They don't agree with you. That, that is true. There is a lot of disagreement on that. I just tend to look at the Jewish culture and not what some modern white guy has to say. <clears throat> uh-huh. Modern white guy. Most commentators are white. Oh or like when Jesus. Or at another way, a more politically way, of, correct way of saying that is, I tend to look at the Jewish history and culture and what rabbis even say today, versus what a Protestant uh, Christian would say about a Jewish culture. It's kind of like if I wanted to know about the Muslim faith, I'm I'm not going to go ask a Christian about a Muslim faith. I'm I'm going to go ask an imam or an actual Muslim. But I wouldn't divide a church about it. I really don't care if he drank or not. Who cares? That's one of the, that's one of those things. He came. He died. I mean, they did, they didn't salvation. convince me, but you know, it was like it was like, why are you telling people this when you really don't know? What because what they were suggesting was that he was drinking just grape juice with a little sweetener in it. Well, here's the one thing that we also have to remember, okay? Uh, and, and I'll get back to you, Mark, I promise. Just, just real quick. Is when it comes to alcohol in the Jewish time, okay, it wasn't some Jack Daniels 100% proof or Everclear or something like that, all right? Is that it was typically... <laughs> hey, I'm just saying, okay? <laughs> is that it was typically three parts water to one part wine, or one part out, what we would say alcohol. So it was a very watered down, okay? There would be more alcohol in one of those little airport, you know, thingy-mabobs. I don't, I don't know what they're called. You're like TSA. What are those little things called? The things that get on there. You know, the little alcohol things. Okay, there we go. The little there'd be more alcohol in one of those little airplane bottles than there would be in a full glass of Jewish wine. Anyhow, go ahead. I'll tell you, the Jewish wine then probably tasted like our communion cups did this last Sunday morning if you had my batch. <laughs> I remember when you said them all back. You were a part where they were accusing Jesus of being an alcoholic, and he says, "I'm not my brother John." He didn't say. I'm Drinking. Right. Yeah, and, you know, the people thought that about them. You think in Acts chapter 2, when the apostles are, are speaking, you know, Peter, he's got to get up and he's like, guys, look, these men aren't drunk like you think they are. It's no, only 9 o'clock in the morning, you know. Um, and then he goes on to, to do his preaching and, and, and everything else. Um, but, yeah, Paul, for example, Timothy, he was a teetotaler and he didn't drink at all. And, uh, you know, he had some stomach problems, what they were, we have no idea. Um, and Paul told him, take a little wine for your stomach. 
because uh, it would help settle the stomach. Most people think that if there were, if it were a bacterial infection, then the uh, then the alcohol in the fermented, you know, grapes in it, everything would have helped kill that and what have you. Um, and so, and, and yeah. <laughs> Any other thoughts or comments? Now, now that we, we you know, got on our bikes and went down this path, right? No, no, that's that's perfectly fine. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Well, you know, Mike, that says that's been drunk. We won't go on into all that. That is true. And we won't go into all that. Also says stay sober. What did you say? Bible also says. Stay sober. Yeah, yes. Stay sober. So, 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 yeah. Yep. Change what would you want? Be sober. Be sober. Be vigilant. Be sober. Yeah. Be sober minded. Some say. Yeah, now be we're vigilant. going down a rabbit trail. Okay. <laughs> yeah, now we're going down a rabbit trail. Yep. And realistically, we'll just kill it right there. <laughs> Well, and here's why, because the next section was actually going to look at verses 3 through 14. And to be honest with you, we don't have, uh, we can't cover 3 through 14 in six minutes. No. You know? We couldn't even cover it. <laughs> but then people would forget. I tell you what, before next Wednesday, read 3 through 14. Okay. You know? Well, that was fun. Uh, let's uh, let's have a quick prayer though, and then we'll be done. Uh, our heavenly Father, Almighty God, we thank you for this time that we have together, and we pray that as we go out into the world, that we would do so with the expectation that opportunities will be presented, and that we will create opportunities for ourselves to share the gospel. Father, we pray that we will look to your word in all things, for your word is the light. Uh, to our path, and that we'll be guided by its direction, leaving all of the consequences to you. We thank you for our time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you all very much.